Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 75 of the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast, brought to you by Scrapyard Boxing Club in Peterborough, Ontario, and Kerry Hendren Remax All Stars Realty Inc. in Omimi. I'm Jason Tufexis, and with me, Ryan Scalia, still sporting that COVID hair. Man, uh, how long are you letting this go for, buddy? Yeah, we'll see, but I just want to clarify no, I'm not related to uh, Archer Betrabiev or Habib. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know, we haven't done a show in a while, been pretty inactive over the summer, but hopefully we get back to some consistency. We got a lot of, you know, a lot of Canadian fighters just fought, a lot coming up, Quebec opening up, so good times ahead. Absolutely, man. We got some big news. We got a lot to catch up on. And you're right about the inactivity, man. Um, This, uh, I feel like Gary Russell Jr. over here. It's uh, been a while. We were doing our notes for the for the review section. And I was like, man, we haven't done one since. Oh, geez. All right. So let's get right back into it. We'll start fresh and work our way back. Uh, It's it'll be a little bit less noticeable that way. Let's go straight to this past Sunday night. Cody, the crippler Crowley, makes his PBC debut in L.A. at the Microsoft Theater. A whitewash, 10-round, unanimous decision win over Josh Torres. And uh, Scalia, man, he did what he had to do. He won pretty much every minute of every round. Yeah, won pretty much every second of every round. You know, from the opening bell, he was just too strong, dictated. You know, the geography of the fight, high work rate, good conditioning, like Crowley always has. And probably against the best guy he's fought so far, you know, a solid guy who's never been knocked out. So, you know, you couldn't have expected Crowley to knock him out, but 10 rounds in the bank, you know, after a bit of a layoff to the pandemic. So let's see what's next for him with PBC, you know, maybe another kind of fight like that, a slight step up. And then after that one, maybe he gets thrown into the mix with their uh, welterweights. Absolutely. And when you look at that mix of welterweights, PBC is the place to be. Uh, there's no question, man. So congrats to Cody Crowley on his big fight in the U.S., of course, getting his start at Scrapyard Boxing Club in Peterborough, which is open for business, folks, if you're in the Peterborough area. Make sure you head over there. Uh, you got to fill out a form on the website first, but then you will be in business. Um, now, That was the good news in terms of Canadian fights. Let's keep moving backwards. Back to Friday in Moscow, the Crimean Lion, Artur Ziadinov, of course, signed with Eye of the Tiger Management. Uh, Most of his fights have been in Montreal and in the Quebec region uh, over this last uh, while now. And he went back home prior to the pandemic uh, to Russia, couldn't come back. He was training with Ramsey before that. Uh, First fight at 175 did not go so well uh, against Gassan Gassanov, Scalia. Yeah, I mean, obviously didn't have any training with Ramsey. First time making 175, probably didn't have, you know, all the usual uh, nutritionists and all that that he had with him. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, Mark Ramsey and a nutritionist or whatever, they can't really teach you to have balls. You know, that's just the way to put it. Because, you know, it's about your character in the ring as a fighter and, he he got hit hard a few times and then from like round four or five on he got on his bike the whole time basically uh backpedaled the whole fight you know uh, circled around the ring didn't really do much aside from get walked down for the rest of the fight and that's why he lost so and we've uh, i know you said it before you want to see him be meaner yeah and uh maybe it's just not in his temperament you know um, yeah no he, he's obviously he... Yeah, because obviously, like, when he's fighting like these Mexican and Argentine guys, obviously he can just walk forward and steamroll them. Yeah. But when you're, when you're in with a real real guy, you know, Gasanov, you know, he, he can punch. And he's a, even though he's been knocked out in, like, eight of his eight losses or whatever it is, you know, he's fought, like, tons of top, you know, light heavy and super middleweight prospects, and they've all stopped him. But, you know, he has sprung a few upsets here and there, and he's heavy-handed and aggressive, so... You know, he's, a, he's kind of a dangerous guy, but if you're a real prospect, you should be beating guys like Gasanov. So, yeah, it was a pretty disappointing fight, you know, just because of kind of the temperament he showed yeah. in the ring. You know, yeah. after, after he got hit hard, he kind of got on his bike for the rest of the fight. That's, you know, like you said, I have mentioned it before. That's always been my concern with Ziad Dinov. He's such a nice guy. You talk to him uh, prior to fights, after fights, whenever you run into him. He's a very sweet guy. And, uh, you know, there 
a lot of fighters are very nice when you talk to them, but there's some kind of underlying edge that you can kind of see when you talk to them and feel. Um, and I just, I'm not sure that Ziyadinov has that. You know, we've been through this before. There have been a few times where he's given guys a break um, when he could have gone in for the kill. Yeah, like uh, when the guy puked. When the guy threw up <laughs> and he just kind of stood there. That was an interesting moment, no doubt. Um, so, you know, and that's the kind of thing, like you said, that can't be trained. That's that's something innate. So the question is, Scalia, where does he go from here? He said afterwards, you know, he's uh, he's beaten but not broken. Um, he, he's ready to continue. This is just a learning experience. Uh but this is, this is a tough situation for Eye of the Tiger. This is an expensive proposition to bring these guys over here. And at a certain point, I guess you have to make a decision as to where your fighter is going to go. How far is he going to go? How long are you willing to support him living in a different country um, you know, uh, and paying for his training, paying for everything else? So in your opinion, where does Ziadinov go? Well, obviously we found out you know, from Corey Erdman on the broadcast and from Mathieu Boulay in Journal de Montréal that his contract is up at the end of the year. Um, I, the Tiger, has matching rights. So it's going to be up to up to them if they want to keep him. But I mean, the thing is, like, I'm not sure if, like, did he leave Mark Ramsey or did he just go home after his last fight and get stuck through the pandemic? So yeah, I'm, not ex- I'm, yeah, I'm not exactly yeah. sure, like, if he left or did he just get stuck when he went back home. Yeah. So I'm not sure what he's going to do, but you know, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good performance, you know. Yeah. yeah. But we'll see it if he wants to come back to Montreal or if he wants to stay in Russia. I mean, if he wants to stay in Russia, I mean, I don't see the points of yeah. of keeping him. And even even if he comes to Montreal, I mean, he's kind of already shown his his level in that fight. Obviously, you know, he didn't train with Ramsey for that fight. So I'm sure he could have been better with Ramsey, but at the end of the day, it's more of a temperamental thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and he's also between weight classes. You know, yeah. at, at 175, there's some killers uh, over there. Who knows how he did with making that weight? And at cruiser, I just don't know if he could bang with the big boys uh, that right. are cutting down to 200 to 199. Uh, so yeah, t- tough one. Uh, again, very, very nice guy. I hope the best for him. And we'll find out pretty soon, I guess, uh, what happens with that contract. Now, let's move back into August. Tony, Lightning, Lewis, big fight on ESPN, in the bubble, in Las Vegas. And he dropped a, a very one-sided 10-round unanimous decision loss to Arnold Barboza Jr. Uh, Scalia, that was not Tony's night, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, Arnold Barbosa is a real contender, you know, a guy who steadily improved over the years and the naturally way bigger guy than, yeah. than Tony Lewis. So, you know, Lewis, Lewis hung in there, but Barbosa won every round pretty much, so... It was a tough proposition, you know, especially during pandemic and probably didn't have like eight weeks notice or whatever. But, you know, Barbosa was just a better guy. Yeah. Now, you know, with a with a, another loss uh, in a step up fight, uh, granted on a big stage, I kind of hope that uh, that Lewis decides to stick around in Canada a little bit, fight some of the other guys. Um, you know, there, we have some fighters once boxing gets back going uh, that I'm sure would love to have that matchup. So uh, I wouldn't mind seeing that coming up, uh, to, you know, as he rebuilds, I guess, looking for another chance, depends on what he wants to do, but uh, you know, power to him for going out there and taking on a true up and coming prospect in Barboza jr. Now um, probably the saddest one of all for me, the most frustrating one watching, I'm sure for most of us here in Canada, a week prior to that, we're going all the way back to August 22nd, our very own former world champion, Eliator Storm Alvarez, stopped in the ninth round by Joe Smith Jr., um, Ryan Man Smith fought a very, very good fight. Um, Eliator just didn't have it. It looks like the further along in his career as he gets, the more hesitant he is to pull the trigger, uh, the less answers he has. Um, my question to you, is this the end of the road for Eliator Storm Alvarez? Well, it is at the top level. I mean, just the fact, sir, he's 36. He's clearly lost a step. And when your own trainer is saying that to the media, then, 
you know, it's pretty much done. I mean, if he wants to come back, he's basically just going to be an opponent, you know, for these light heavyweights. And if he wants to make a bit extra money before he retires, then, then sure. But, I mean, he's probably going to take more damage doing it, yeah. which is why Mark Ramsey pretty much said to the media that he should retire. So, yeah, I mean, sucks to see, but, you know, Father Time is undefeated. And uh, later, he had a nice run. But, he uh, did. All, all good things must come to an end. Absolutely, man. I mean, look, uh, from, from the very beginning, uh, making it all the way to world champion, uh, it's some pretty impressive stuff. I know he still has his family in Colombia. I'm assuming he's made a couple of decent paydays. I'm guessing that with those paydays, you could probably live pretty nicely back in Colombia if he decides to move back there to be with his family. So, you know, I do hope that, that, uh, that he does go back. It is frustrating to watch a guy that, you know, you know, has a lot of talent, uh, not do what he's supposed to do. I'm sure obviously it was frustrating for Ramsey too. Um, but, uh, again, he, he, he can keep that belt forever. You know, like that's such an incredible thing to have achieved. Um, and he made, uh, he made Quebec proud. So I'm hoping uh, as well, Scalia, that uh, he doesn't bother to go back down to the, you know, uh, under the elite level at this point and just moves on, moves back and, uh, and has a good life for himself. He is the NABO welterweight champion, and he's just landed in the U.S. on his way to the biggest fight of his career this Saturday night. He'll be the main event on ESPN as he takes on the mean machine, Kavaliauskas. Uh, Mikhail Zuski, man, welcome back to the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast, buddy. My pleasure, guys. My pleasure, of course. Thank you for, uh, for talking to us from the airport uh, on American soil. Uh, talk to us a little bit, first of all, about what it was like um, getting out of Canada, getting into the U.S. Was it weird? Not really. I mean, I've been doing this for a while, coming to Vegas for my fights into to the United States. So it was just like, just as usual, but I haven't been here in a while. But, uh, you know, of course, with a mask on in the airport right now, I'm just staying away from everybody, hopefully. Nobody pulls up to me screaming about putting my mask on, <laughs> but it's a mask everywhere and a plane. And it's a little weird, but you just, just get used to it. Just deal with it. I like the, I like the branded mask though, man. It's looking good. But uh, <laughs> look, let's talk about the big news, which is you finally got the big fight that you have been waiting for. Last time you were on the show, we talked about that too. You're at the stage of your career where it's all about that big fight now. Um, with a win, on Saturday night, what does that do for your career, man? Oh, it does. It does everything that I need right now. It puts me, you know, uh, it gives me. It gives me a lot of credit. A lot of credit uh, to be considered as a legitimate uh, welterweight contender. If I win in a good in a good manner, there's no one that can say that I don't belong or in a ring with a champion or I can't call anybody out. You know, I feel like if I win, if I knock him out, I stop him, or I win, you know, a, a, a white decision. Uh, I will be allowed and legitimate to call Crawford out or any of the champions. That's what I think it does. Amazing, man. Amazing. So right now we're recording this. It is Wednesday morning. Um, you are in Chicago, right? Exactly. We had a four hours uh, stop here in Chicago. <laughs> There's not so many flights right now yeah. uh, from Montreal to Vegas. So we had to deal with that, but it's okay. Just taking my time here and, uh, and, uh, breathing and staying calm and it's going to be a long days of traveling but it's going to be okay so once you do arrive in las vegas uh between here and the fight how do you anticipate it going like have you already pretty much hit your weight do you think it's going to be strange to try and um continue your training within that bubble how do you think it's going to go now for the rest of this week I think it's going to be uh, just the same as usual. When you go, when you go you know, into a fight, you stay in your room. You don't do much. So I feel like uh, I think when we land in Vegas, we can stop to a grocery store to just grab some things that we need to eat, like for uh, weight loss or whatever, fruits and vegetables, and then get to the room and uh, you get tested right away. And when you, your, your test is negative, then you're into the bubble and you can't leave it. So uh, it's just going to be whenever I, whenever I fight, I just, I just go out to eat and that's what we're going to do. They're going to bring us to the convention center in, uh, in the MGM, whereas only fighters and camp are allowed to go. So we're not going to go to restaurants with public or anything. We're not allowed to have any interaction with the public. So it's just going to be in that, those two rooms that they, 
they have for us to eat and go back to the room and just chill. That's what we do anyway. So it's not a big, a big thing for me, but, uh, the weight loss, the weight loss is good. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, obviously I gotta, I gotta dehydrate like every fight, just lose uh, a few pounds over there. And, uh, but other than that, for, you know, I'm, I'm pretty on point right now. I'm where I, where I need to be. So your last fight, um, I believe you injured your thumb in the last fight, right? Exactly. I broke my right thumb in a third round in a fight that went, you know, ultimately you stopped him in the 10th round. Yeah. Yeah. So then you had to pull out of the fight in March and then the pandemic came. But would you say maybe like the pandemic was kind of like a blessing in disguise in terms of recovering from the injury? Yes. And I was just a couple, like I was hesitant. It was like, you know, are we really going into a fight without being a hundred percent? Like, it wasn't like a big, like, it wasn't like if my thumb was hanging or anything, it was just like, it cracked a little bit. I could feel pain. I couldn't spar properly. I couldn't throw it like a hundred percent. And it was like, at this point being in the rankings, is it worth to just go into a fight, you know, with that kind of injury? And uh, I think if the fight would have been like two weeks out uh, later, I would have taken the fight and it would have been okay. Uh, the blessing is that while everybody stopped, you know, the rankings didn't move, didn't move me, they didn't move me down or up for a matter of fact. But I mean, it's not like you can get a lap or passed by anyone. It's just like everybody stops. But I wouldn't say it's the blessing in any matter because I had to take time off training and I don't like that. I don't have to, I don't like to, the fact that I could not go to the gym if I wanted to. I'm, I'm a guy that trains all the, all the time. Even though if, if I'm not going to have a fight, I just train, you know, lightly. But I, I work on things, and I couldn't do that. So that was that was a little painful, but we worked through it. So with the boxing situation in Quebec, I believe you weren't, like, allowed to do sparring until last week? Let's not talk about that. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean... I mean, really, like, yeah. are you are you not going to spar for a fight that big? I mean, let's not just okay. not talk about that. Really, I'm not going to go into a fight without, pro- you know, proper training. So, uh, you know, according to the law, I wasn't allowed to, but let's just not talk about it. Oh, yeah, okay. So, we'll, we'll delete that. <laughs> so, like, what, how good was your training camp, you know, in the pandemic? It was, it was pretty, I mean... Uh, Yvonne Michel told me as soon as ESPN started the fights with Tarper, he said, you know, just try to stay, you know, within, he said, how many weeks do you need? I said, we were in the complete pandemic shutdown. I was training in my garage. I said, right now I need eight weeks, but in two, in two weeks, I will tell you six weeks. I'm starting now. So I'll try to stay six weeks within six weeks of a fight. And then as time went on, I was just training and training and feeling so good. I said, Yvonne, I need four weeks. And we had offers for like three, two weeks. And I was like, I need to make weight. That's the only problem. Other than that, I would have taken the fight. So we said, okay, we take the fight, but give, give us just two more weeks. And then uh, uh, Carl Moretti texted me uh, from Tarp Rank uh, privately on Twitter. He said, uh, you, you would have six weeks. Could you be ready? What, what about your thumb? And I said, my thumb is good right now. Let's go. And he didn't say no opponent. and was like, who are you thinking? And he said, Cavaluskas. And I was like, oh, my God, perfect. Let's go. That is awesome, man. And really, you know, I'm sure you've watched a lot of Mean Machine in the past. He looked really nice in his last fight. Uh, how do you evaluate him as a fighter? And, uh, you know, what are some of the flaws that, uh, that you see in his game? Obviously, you're not going to give away all your secrets for the game plan. But, but what do you think of Kavaliaskis as a fighter? I think he's a very good, I mean, he's been to the Olympic twice. Uh, he's a very skilled fighter. He's super fast, super explosive. And he has that power that you cannot count out. I mean, he's, he's, he's a powerful, powerful guy. guy. Uh, he's very technical, too. But he's a little stiff. Uh, you know, he's a little stiff. He likes to throw hard all the time. He's a little stiff. And he doesn't like it when, you know, he likes a, he likes a slow-paced fight. He likes to take his time to be able to look at And I'm like that a little bit, too. I'll, I'll be honest with you. But I feel like we worked on things in the camp where I can step it up, step it up a little bit. But uh, you know he's he's been to the Olympic twice. He's been he's been a, a good. He had like 300 amateur fights. But the thing is, he stepped when he whenever he stepped up like against the top guys, he got beat down. He got beat down against Crawford. That's only it's the only chance that he got at you know a good, like a great great fighter. But in the amateurs, he also got stopped in the in the World Championships in 29 when I when I, when I beat the Cuban, he was there too. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, he, at the hunt, he was in the lower weight class, I believe, but he got stopped by Frankie Gomez, uh, the American. And uh, I mean, he got stopped. Three knockdowns, sending eight counts. And uh, I think like his chin is, is, a, is an issue for sure. And I feel like uh, I might not be Adonis Stevenson. I might not be the biggest puncher, but I feel like I definitely have the power to hurt him. Yeah, so your last fight, I think probably the best performance of your career. I mean, it was after four straight decisions, and then you got a knockout in the last round against a very tough opponent. So do you feel like after all these years kind of climbing back from the Ponomara fight that you've gone to like a, a new level in terms of your skill set? I wouldn't say the skill set. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I was less skilled before whatever. I just think that it's uh, to realize that, you know, before Ponomarev, I thought that I, I was going to stop everyone and hurt everyone. I thought my power was something else. And at some point, you're just going to fight a guy that's going to stand there. He's not going to care about how powerful you are. And every 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 fighter with power, they, they get a guy like that. That's, they're just going to stand there. And I had to realize uh, how to win rounds, how to stay calm and break a guy down is what I, that's what I did in my last fight. I just took all his tools one by one and he was so desperate when he got hit, he would just went down. Like it was, it was over. There's no way I knew it. Like the way I, I kind of laughed when he fell, I just knew like, it was just the final punch that I knew that I had to place at that time because he didn't have any, any tools left to try anything else to try. So I broke him down and that's what I think I can do against Kavlus- Kavluskas too. Cause I think he has that, that flaw too, that he thinks that, He's going to hurt everyone. That's what he does. He hurts people and they, they quit mentally and then he stops him. And Crawford did not do that. So in terms of like fighting with no fans, I mean, you have like over 150 amateur fights you fought on undercards where there's almost no fans. So it shouldn't be a problem, right? I don't think, I think it could be an advantage because I'm coming from Canada. I'm the guy coming on the B side. I'm flying in. I'm coming over there. Uh, you know, I would be the guy that, the crowd would probably put at the disadvantage and uh, it's just going to be like a, you know, just a sparring session in the gym, just an intense one. Whereas uh, two guys are just trying to knock each other out. But other than that, I don't feel like it's going to be, it's going to feel different for sure, but you cannot like let that touch you in any, any matter. You just do your thing. It's a, it's a big fight. I have to deliver and uh, I will, I'm sure I will. So big fight coming up in just a few days, man. You told everyone you want to give Quebec fans something to cheer for. Um, what is this fight, if you win here, what does it do in your eyes for Quebec boxing right now? Well, I feel it gives us, uh, right now we don't have any, we don't know where it's going. We don't have any direction. You know, Alvarez just lost. Uh, Stevenson, what happened is out of the picture. There, there's good t- talents that are out there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny that. There's very, very good fighters coming out of Quebec right now. But uh, you know, there's not so many higher level guys are who are fighting at a championship level. And I feel like I could, I could potentially be that guy. Hopefully, I can uh, be that guy that carries the sport for a little while and give the opportunity to the younger ones to to build a record under under my main events. Hopefully, I can be that guy. But I feel like people need something to, to, to someone to cheer and uh, someone to, to just be behind. And I feel like maybe this win uh, could make people believe, believe in me that, you know, I'm the thing and I can really compete at the championship level. We can use a big win, man, no doubt. Uh, Mikael, man, this is so much fun for me. Uh, you know, I've known you since before your pro, your pro debut. Uh, I'll be watching Saturday night along with everybody else here in Canada and on the, in the U.S. too. Uh, we wish you a ton of luck, man, this week as you lead up to the big event. And thank you again for, for joining us here on the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast on, during your layover on your way, man. My, my pleasure, man. Always cool to chat with you guys. I think we're having a little bit of a connection issue here, but uh, thanks to you guys so much. Thank you.